the founder. And Imam Sulaiman ibn Ali al-Musharraf is the father of the next Grand Qadi. And the next Grand Qadi after him, who inshallah we'll discuss in the next class, is Abdul Wahhab ibn Sulaiman al Najdi. He was an alim, Qadri in his tariqah, and the father of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. But his teaching licenses were all put in his oldest son, Sulaiman ibn Abdul Wahhab, the older brother of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, and the greatest opponent of Salafiyah in that time, and the first to write a book against Salafiyah. So, inshallah, we will be discussing that further in later lessons, inshallah. Now we talk about deaths during this time. We have Zainuddin Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad ibn Farfur, the great Hanafi Qadi of Sham. The Farfur family is still highly prized today. The Farfurs are still in Sham, in Damascus. They're a major family. They are one of the, when you hear certain names, Maidani, Furfur, when you hear names like that and they're giving fatwa or what have you today for the Hanafis, those are the people you listen to that are alive. When you hear those names, these are people that aren't just, they're not just sheikhs, they're not just muftis, they're qadis. They're qadis. The Farfurs give fatwa for all of Sham. Right? The Farfurs are a famous family. Further to this, we have Abu Sa'adat, Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Ali al-Fakihi al-Makki, the Hanbali judge, Shihabuddin Muhammad ibn Muhammad al-Sindi, Hanafi scholar of Hadith, Rahmatullah ibn Abdullah al-Sindi. All of these scholars died in 992AH. We also have Jamal, uh, Jamaluddin Muhammad, uh, Muhammad ibn Sadiq al-Hanafi, who was one of the few Hanafi scholars to come from Yemen who died in 996 AH. Reason why he's one of the few is because of the fact that Yemen is primarily Shafi'i. So there are few Hanafi scholars that are based, based in Yemen. There are a few in some of the highlands of Yemen. There are some Hanafi scholars, but not enough to sort of make a madrasa or to sort of go there and study it consistently. There's just, there just aren't enough. Because in order to study something, it has to be in demand. So you have Muslim brothers that have been to Sham. And there weren't more than eight students. So the Shaykh comes in and says, there aren't enough of you to study Hanafi fiqh, so you're all going to study Shafi'i fiqh for the next two years. And I'm like, subhanAllah, <laughs> we've come here to study Hanafi fiqh. Yeah, but there aren't enough of you. So what do you want me to do? The Shafi'i country, what do you want? <laughs> Syria is a Shafi'i country. Now, listen, I'm going to hand out the books now. And he just handed out the books. And for two years, there was nothing they could do. Because it's not his fault. It has to do with the demand. So if you don't have enough people, then you can't build up a madrasa and you can't build up a following among the people. And that's the difficulty that they had in Yemen. They were never able to establish. One of the places that you'll find has few <clears throat> people upon the Hanafi school is Arabia and Yemen. Well, Yemen is part of Arabia, but some people consider it as separate. That's a place where the Hanafi school has never really been able to get a proper foothold. Even during the Ottomans, which were expansive builders, the Abbasids, for whatever reason, it could never get a really strong foothold. And when you look at the mihrabs around the Kaaba in the old pictures, the smallest one is the Hanafi one because it had the least people that were resident there in, Me in Mecca. Not because of any inferiority, but just it had to do with demand and supply. Whereas when you look at Istanbul, the pavilion for the Hanafi, it's, it's gigantic. It's huge. Why? Because all this money was put into it and they were safeguarded and they were the, the, the vast majority of that city. The Turkish today, by and large, are Hanafis. This, you know, the, the, there's nothing else of that with the exception of the Kurds that are immediately north to them, by and large, Shafi's. So it has to do with supply and demand. You had Ahmed ibn Muhammad al Ushaykhiri, who was the second, second chief judge of Arabia. He died in 1012 AH. 
Imam Ahmed ibn Muhammad al Ghushaykari, he memorized the books Al Iqna, Zad al Mustaqni', Arod al Murbi', and some six others, which is about 11 volumes. He memorized that. So when he came back as a Qadi, he was really well grounded. Very, very well grounded. Al Ushaykir. Another one was Imam Badruddin Muhammad al Balbani. He died in 1033 AH. His book, Mukhtasar al Ifadat, is one of the chief books for studying comparative creed. It's one of the skeleton texts for studying. If you want to study comparative creed within Ahl Sunnah, between Hanbalis, Ash'aris, and Maturidis, that book is one of the skeleton manuals. Mukhtasar al Ifadat is also called um, the Mukhtasar. Uh, it's also called the uh, uh, Mukhtasar um, Nihaya uh, by Ibn Hamdan. It's also called the Mukhtasar of that. That is one of the books that you would study because it gives you a greater understanding of these branch differences between Ash'aris, Maturidis, and Hanbalis. Um, he also credits once he was he he had lo he had gone blind. He lost his vision, and he saw Imam Ahmed in a dream and he said please please pray for me and Imam Ahmed said inshallah I will what what do you want me to pray to Allah for about pray that Allah restores my vision and so we did and when he woke up he could see so it's we see the dua is, is important dua is very very important and the righteous people if there's someone that's righteous you ask them to make dua for you Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if it's within his eternal will, he answers. Another is Mar'i ibn Yusuf al-Karmi. He died in 1044 AH. Uh, Mar'i ibn Yusuf al-Karmi is the writer of this book regarding tobacco. Uh, he's a writer of numerous other documents. He wrote another skeleton text called Aqawil uh, al which is a comparative text, but it's, it's, it's a... Uh, advanced to senior level comparative creed text between the three schools among Ahl Sunnah, Ashari's Hanbalis, and Maturidis. It's a comparative document and it's very hefty. And really, you shouldn't read that until you've read the Nihaya, the Mukhtasru Nihaya, the Luma'a, and Al Ain Wal Athar. Then you read, the, read that because it's quite hefty. A lot of the references don't make sense. But you misread them unless you've read them properly in their context. Another is Mansur ibn Yunus al buhuti He died in 1050 AH. Again, a big judge. He learned from Yahya, uh, Yahya ibn Musa al-Hajjawi, who, who was the son of Imam Musa al-Hajjawi. Another alim who died in this time was Omar ibn Muhammad ibn, Fat ibn Fatuh al-Bayquni, Shafi'i scholar in Hadith sciences. He died in 1080. His book, the Bayquniya, if you study hadith in many places, his book, it's called the Manduma al Manduma al Bayquniya. It's an it's an introduction to the sciences of hadith and the study of hadith. What is sahih? What's not sahih? Most of the places that you study, that will be the book that you'll use the Bayquniya. In a lot of the places in the Muslim world, if people have studied it, like you'll find people studied in Damascus, they studied in Cairo, they study it in. Uh, they studied in Indonesia, in Jakarta, they studied in Kuala, uh, Kuala Lumpur, a lot of places. I don't know if it's most places, but a, a, a fair few places. That is the book, the Bayquniya, in Hadith sciences is used for study. Suleiman ibn Ali al-Musharraf al-Najdi, we already talked about him, the third judge of Arabi after Ahmed ibn Atwa. He died in 1079 A.H., and then we have Muhammad ibn Abdul Rasul al Shahrazuri al Barzanji. He died in 1102 AH, and we'll be coming to further that. Uh, we'll be coming further to that later. Now it's interesting because <clears throat> in Imam al Barzanji's book called Ashratu Sa'a, there are numerous ahadith about the, by the Prophet wasallam about Hajj being prevented near the end of time. And Imam Barzinji, Rahimullah, he said, this has only happened partially. 
He said, there have been times where people have prevented people from Sham coming when the Karamiya took over or the Karamita took over. The full prophecy where Hajj was prevented was not realized until the time of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab in which Hajj was stopped for two years. And we'll be coming to that inshallah next week. So it's very important. He said this one is still pending. We live in the time after it. We've already lived. We live to see, or we lived past the time of Mecca being shelled, the curtains of the Kaaba being burned. That happened. That's already happened. Muhammad Abdul Wahhab already did that. Medina being shelled and the people being made to eat the dogs of Medina, that happened. Medina was shelled. Hamna Abdul Hab surrounded the gates, made the people eat the dogs, starved them out. Right? Hajj being stopped for two years. That was in a newspaper in this country, in the United Kingdom. They couldn't believe it. They said the the one of the greatest of the Mohammedan festivals has been interrupted by a band of extremists. So this is the reality. And so a lot of what's coming next week, inshallah, has to do with prophetic incidents that are occurring. Before closing immediately, I just wanted to mention some of the literature that I depended on and will depend on for further discussion about the United States. If you want to really understand the extermination programs, what Columbus and those others did when they arrived and how absolutely bestial they were. This book by Ward Churchill, A Little, a Little Matter of Genocide, very exhaustive. The bibliography, over 500 sources. Over 500 sources. The place where the footprints of the World Trade Center Tower stand is where some of the settlers played kickball with the heads of some of the aboriginal peoples in the U.S had a game of kickball with their heads, right? Very good book. Another book is called Comanches, The History of a People by T.R. Fehrenbach. He makes the following analysis, which again, you have to, you have to understand the American psyche. You have to become students of Occidentalism, the study of the West to understand the mindset of the people that we're dealing with. Listen to this encouraging quote on page 13. Quote, this is the story of the Nermanu or people, a few thousand North American Indians from their prehistoric beginnings to the destruction as an independent people, to their destruction as an independent people. In one sense, the passage of the people was of little importance a minor footnote to American history. It's the destruction of more than 60,000 people. It's a minor footnote in American history. After all, there's 300 million in here now and we've got McDonald's and Wendy's and someone had to give it up in order for us to make it here now. Right? Very good book. Another book is called Slave Nation. How Slavery United the Colonies and Sparked the American Revolution. Showing that the United States was built on slavery and the way that the United States was able to power itself and get independence was to use slavery as a crutch. Very good book. They were denounced numerous times, but all the sources are unimpeachable. Amazing book. Two lawyers, two Harvard lawyers. Amazing, amazing book. Uh, I think you'll find those three to fortify your knowledge and give you a greater understanding of the American psyche, particularly the American psyche of slaughter, encroachment and reinforcement and values clarification. It's okay we slaughtered these hundred million guys because it worked out at the best for everyone in the end. Because what would we have done without McDonald's? Could you imagine life without Baskin Robbins? So it all worked out for the best and for everyone else. And this is how they viewed the world. Finally, I want to mention very quickly about conquest. There are three forms of conquest. There are three forms of conquest, and we're, because we're going to be talking about this. <clears throat> there is a conquest. There is the first type, which is called conquest and rebuilding. 